Welcome back my fellow 10 gigabit fanatics. So you made it all the way to part 3 in our 10 gigabit home area network series. As promised, we're going to overcome the obstacles and expense of networking more than two systems using a custom built 10 gigabit switching solution. If you missed part 1 or part 2 of our 10 gigabit home area network series, make sure you go back and watch those videos first. Part 3 builds off concepts explained in the first and second videos. Follow the embedded links now to watch those videos first. Otherwise, it's time to build a badass 10 gig switch. Here is a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this video. Why build a 10 gig switch? Number one, a custom built switch allows you to meet a specific requirement. If you're only connecting three systems together, then why pay for an expensive eight port vendor switch? Number two, you can achieve an excellent level of customization. This solution employs an advanced feature set that you can leverage if you choose to. Lastly, for some, it just comes down to the cash flow. A custom solution allows you to control your costs better. Now, the part everyone has been waiting for. How in the world do you build a custom 10 gig switch? Well, for starters, you have to build a bridge. According to Wikipedia, a network switch is officially known as a Mac bridge. A switch is a multi-port network bridge that uses hardware addresses to process and forward data at the data link layer, layer two of the OSI model. So to summarize, a switch is a bridge is a switch. So the plan is to combine multiple network interface cards into a reasonable platform load an optimized network operating system, and finally tie multiple ports together using interface bridging. So those of you that guessed bridging, you were correct. Gold star for you. The end result is a customizable 10 gig switching and routing platform that allows for media conversion. In other words, you can throw together a dual port 10 gig SFP plus card, a quad port one gig copper card, and a fiber card. Bridge the ports, and you have just built a media converter. Now are you starting to see the possibilities? There are some pretty interesting things you can do with this type of flexibility. I'll cover a few scenarios in the upcoming section. First things first, let's talk hardware. You can do this with a PC or a server. Just like with anything else, your mileage will vary depending on what you use. See the video description for my setup. You will need a system with at least two PCIe X8 slots for a 10 gigabit four port switch. Your switch will be limited by the number of PCIe slots that you have and cards you use. Don't forget your embedded network ports too. When it comes to the hardware, focus on a motherboard with plenty of bus bandwidth, maximum PCIe slots, X8 for 10 gigabit dual cards, and a decent multi-core processor to reduce CPU loads and increase parallel bandwidth. With the introduction of technologies like DMA, IOAT, DCA, and NAPI, PC hardware is achieving line rate network speeds formerly only seen in data centers on enterprise switches. Software-defined networking is a prime example of this concept already in play. For home users, you don't need a heavy-handed solution. On the other end of the spectrum, aiming for maximum performance, Go with the Xeon E3 or better and IOAT enabled motherboard when planning for port density. Now, for the most critical component in this entire setup, the network operating system. And the winner is VIOS. What is VIOS? Why VIOS? Okay, I'm getting there. VIOS was originally developed by Brocade Communications and known as Viata. In 2013, they stopped development on Viata Core. A group of enthusiast developers forked the source code and created what is now Vios. Quote, Vios is a Linux-based routing solution built on the Debian Linux distribution and currently runs on x86 and x86-64 platforms. End quote. Vios is an incredibly lightweight, heavily customized and optimized distro with the sole purpose of providing layer two and layer three network functionality on a physical or virtual platform. Why did I choose Vios over PFSense as suggested by viewers? The answer is performance, among other things. To be clear, I have only tested the aforementioned distros. I'm sure there are other solutions available though. I discuss further details about my PFSense testing in the summary. I can personally vouch for Vios as a routing switching solution in a production environment. I know others 
Use it as an edge router in data centers, and it is widely used in cloud implementations like Amazon Web Services. Awesome. Now, let's dig in with some digital grease and get these gears moving. Follow along as I narrate the BIOS configuration, BIOS install, basic setup, interface reorder, system setup, bridge creation, bandwidth testing, and useful utilities demo. First up, we're going to start by reviewing some important settings in the BIOS. Check your CPU section and enable Direct Cache Access DCA. Next, under Chipset Northbridge, check for IOAT and VTD settings. Enable IOAT for sure and try no snoop and relaxed ordering if present. In addition, enable VTD and interrupt remapping. Make your way to the PCIe configuration and look for above 4G decoding, maximum payload, and maximum read request. Maximum payload and maximum read request are very important and you'll see why later in the video. Just know that they should be set to the max value. Save your BIOS settings and have a bootable copy of BIOS ready. Boot your system to the BIOS CD. It's a live CD and allows you to run from boot or install an image to disk or USB. The default username or password is BIOS BIOS. Run the install image command to kick off the install. You can get contact sensitive help at any point in the command line by typing question mark. Most of the install process is accepting the defaults. The install is self-explanatory as you can see. I installed to a disk drive, but you can install to USB as you only need about two gig of space total. Set your new BIOS user password and continue accepting defaults. When the install completes, Make sure to reboot your system without the CD. Otherwise, any changes you make at this point will be lost. When you boot into your newly installed image, you're in operational mode. Take a look at your network interfaces with the show interfaces command. Interface names on the left and link status on the right. Capital D signifies nothing is connected to our switch at this point. Plug a copper cat 5 cable into one of your ports and run show interfaces again. Now you can see a lowercase u in the right column, signifying the port is up. A better method is to blink the interface you plan to configure. Run show interfaces ethernet, eth0 identify, to visually blink the interface you plan to configure. At this point, you should notice the command line is structural in nature, and remember to use the question mark to better understand your options. We've been working in operational mode. Now we're going to enter what is known as configuration mode. This allows you to modify your system configuration. We're going to set the IP address of interface eth1 where we connected our cable. Notice the slash 24 at the end of the IP address. This is our subnet mask specified in CIDR notation. Slash 24 is equivalent to 255.255.255.0. Now, set a description on the interface. Remember to always label for easier troubleshooting. Next, allow a terminal program like PuTTY to connect to your new interface. Run the command compare to see a list of queued commands ready for execution. They do not take effect until you issue a commit command. Following the commit, you need to save so your changes are persistent across reboots. Did you notice a plus sign next to the queued commands? This means they are a new addition to your configuration, just as a minus sign would mean they are being removed from configuration. Exit configure mode and show interfaces to see if changes have taken effect. In this optional section, I'm going to show you how you can reorder your ports however you like. BIOS may not place your ports in an order that makes sense. So, if you are particular like me, I'll show you how to customize it exactly how you want it. 
I'm going to use the Linux if config command to pull and sort by the MAC addresses. Essentially, we're going to reassign the MAC addresses to the interfaces in a different order. Fun fact, the first three octets of a MAC address identify the vendor of the hardware. So try macvendors.com to look up a NIC vendor. Awesome troubleshooting technique, by the way. Once you sort by your MAC addresses, copy it out to an editor for reference. In my list, the bottom four Macs belong to four embedded Intel NICs. You can tell by the matching first five octets and last octet order. So I will make these interfaces ETH0 through ETH3. The remaining interfaces, all 10 gig, will be ETH4 through ETH11 for a total of 12 ports on my homebrew switch. Before you make this kind of change, it does not hurt to back up your main configuration file at slash config slash config dot boot. Enter configure mode and use the hw-id command to reassign the physical port to the logical ethernet interfaces in your preferred order. Notice I'm using abbreviated versions of the command to minimize typing. You only have to type enough of the command to make it distinct from other commands. Here, I'm taking the lower four MAC IDs and assigning them to ETH0 through ETH3. Then I assign the top eight MAC IDs to ETH4 through ETH11. Since it's sorted by MAC ID, it will have the effect of correcting the Ethernet interface order. See how the compare command shows a greater than symbol? This means you are replacing a configuration item instead of adding or subtracting from the configuration. Finally, commit, save, exit, and reboot for the remapping to take effect. After rebooting, you may need to reallocate your IP address so you can putty back into your switch. Here, I show how to remove the configuration. If you just tried to set the IP again, it would add a secondary IP address on the interface. On the system console, I will remove the IP from ETH1 and add it back to ETH0 where my link status is up. Now I can putty back in and everything looks good once again. Connect to your switch with PuTTY and enter configure mode. If you type show interfaces in config mode, it will show the current or running state of your configuration. This is completely different than displaying the contents of your config.boot file. You can also show other subsections of your running config. For example, show system shows the system related aspects of your configuration. Let's go through some basic configuration settings to get things running smoothly, starting with your host name. Next, set your gateway address so you can communicate with the outside world. Then finally, DNS and time zone. Compare your changes, verify, commit, and save. Ping sun.com to test your connectivity to the outside world and check that time is syncing correctly with the command ntpq space dash p. You can also use the command show NTP from operational mode. This completes the section on system setup.
Time to build our bridge. Use a console or serial connection for this portion as we need to reconfigure our management IP again. Log in, show your interfaces, enter configure mode, and remove the IP address from ETH0. Notice this time around, my delete command stops at address. VIOS allows you to remove configuration at various levels. Now compare, verify, and commit. Here is where we create our pseudo interface BR0 and assign it an IP address. This interface represents our bridge or a collection of interfaces forwarding packets to each other at layer two. Assign a meaningful description to your bridge interface. Looking at our compare statement, notice how default options are assigned to the new bridge. Commit and save. Well, in configure mode, you can show interfaces by using the keyword run. You can now see newly created interface BR0 with assigned IP address, subnet mask, and description. Let's identify a port where we can connect our one gig uplink. Again, blink ETH2 to visually identify. Okay, plugged in and showing a link up on ETH2. Since we have our bridge interface in place, we will assign Ethernet ports 2 through 11 to the bridge. This gives us 10 bridged ports. You could assign all your interfaces to the bridge, but it's not required and you can change it later anyway. Remember, ETH0 through ETH3 represent my 1 gig copper ports while ETH4 through ETH11 represent my 10 gig direct attached copper ports. In the video, I mistakenly started with ETH3 when I should have started with ETH2. Next, add a description to each interface. For your 10 gig interfaces, you want to set your MTU to 9000 as I discussed in part 2 of the series. When finished assigning interfaces, setting descriptions, and adjusting MTU, don't forget to compare, review, commit, and save. After I make some quick corrections to my descriptions, show interfaces, and marvel at your shiny new 10 gigabit switch that you lovingly crafted by hand. Isn't she a beauty? I run the command sudo ifconfig-s to verify my 10 gigabit interfaces are set to use jumbo frames. At this point, save your configuration. Your 10 gigabit switch build is complete. Now, let's see what this baby can do. Let's start by checking our bandwidth to the bridge itself. Open a few terminal windows to the new switch on workstation one. The top left window is running a session of iperf server and binding to the switch IP. The lower left window is running the top command. So we can monitor CPU utilization, context switching, and the iperf process. The right window is the jperf client. Workstation number one is connected directly to the 10 gigabit bridge via direct attached copper. So at this point, we are just going from workstation one to the switch. For this test, we are getting around 9.5 gigabits per second, which is excellent. Everything looks great. For the second bandwidth test example, workstation number one is connected to the VIOS switch and workstation number two is connected to the VIOS switch. The top left window is running a utility on switch called BMON, bandwidth monitor, to visualize our receive and transmit traffic and top is running in the bottom left window on workstation number two. Workstation number two is using a slower dual core processor to demonstrate how it changes the bandwidth picture. Notice iperf is pegged at 100% CPU with one stream of traffic from workstation number one. So let's try pushing two streams of traffic and see what happens.
you can see two streams of traffic allow us to hit our 10 gigabit mark. So the VIOS switch is not our problem. It's the architecture of workstation number two that can't handle a single stream of 10 gig traffic. Another good test. For the third test, consider what happens when heavy traffic has to traverse your system bus. In other words, inbound traffic on card one is forwarded to card three outbound. In my testing, I discovered great speeds when I forwarded traffic across the same card, inbound card one to outbound card one. This made sense as the traffic was local to the network interface card. But when I passed traffic across cards, my results were less than desirable and a bit shaky to boot. Digging in a bit further, I realized it was important to adjust BIOS settings to ensure my PCIe bus was using maximum possible payload values. This made all the difference in the world. For this test, I was using a much more capable workstation number two so I could avoid any processor bottlenecks. Upon making the PCIe adjustment in my BIOS, shown in the BIOS settings segment, things were screaming fast once again. You can see the chart waver slightly, but in my testing without recording video, it was a very consistent 10 gigabit per second. Here's what the CPU looks like on workstation number one. Bear in mind, it's consuming proc cycles while I record video too. And here's a 10 gigabit ethernet adapter on workstation number one. Perfect. These were the results I was looking for. As promised, I threw in some power goodies for being so patient while I put the final touches on the last video in the three part series of 10 gigabit home network. Since these last three short sections are self explanatory, kick back and enjoy the music. Here are some amazingly powerful commands I demonstrate and make sure you catch the summary following the utility demo as there are some really important tips I include. There are some pretty amazing things you can do with this build. We built a 10 gig switch, but you could build a 10 gig router, a 10 gig firewall, a 10 gig media converter, or a 10 gig VPN. 
Keep in mind it will only be as good as the hardware you use. Make sure your network adapters receive good airflow from your case fans as they tend to get hot, especially if you are stacking multiple cards next to each other. On the topic of why I selected Vios over PFSense or some other distro, I selected Vios because it's purpose-built tool with a focus on switching, routing, NAT, and firewall. On the other hand, PFSense is focused on boundary protection acting as a firewall. You can bridge interfaces, but packets are still inspected and require a firewall rule, unless you completely disable the firewall functionality on your PFSense system. Even at that point, performance was still erratic during my testing. I encourage you to test for yourself if PFSense is your preferred platform. My intent is not to start a flame war or distro showdown. My point is that you always want to use the right tool for the right job, and testing is how you get there. All right, guys, I had an amazing time assembling this three-part series and interacting with everyone throughout the process. The feedback I have been receiving is overwhelmingly positive and helped me structure this series in a way that benefits you even more than I originally intended. I can't thank you enough for all the thumbs up and shares. Keep the comments flowing and subscribe if you enjoyed the series. This is iTechStorm wishing you happy bandwidth trails.